Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Emma, um, and I'd like to tell you my story about um, Aniron's journey through uh, diagnosis. Um, this is very much a team effort today, um, and Aniron couldn't be with me because I think he would have found it a bit overwhelming. Um, but he's very much a part of this presentation. Um, and he wanted me to start off by asking everyone in the audience if everyone knew what a plushie was, because he is a distinguished plushie, plushie collector. So hands up if anyone knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is his collection. Um, and we put them all on the bed and we um, photographed them all. Um, and when we were putting it all together, I asked an iron, I said, why, why do you like plushies, an iron? Um, and he said, well, really, it's because I can make interactions with them and I can recreate scenes and they're not in real life. Because an iron's real life can be quite challenging. So this is his way of escaping. So the start of our journey into autism started in 2014. Um, we were called into the school um, and the teachers mentioned that um, we, they wanted to start an individual uh, educational plan for an iron. They said that his organisational skills were, were um, becoming quite difficult, that he was struggling to organise himself through the day and also um, he was um, finding it very difficult to interact with children. So they set a number of uh, targets. So they described his difficulties, um, his targets, what we needed to, to do as a family, and what he needed to do um, and the school needed to do, and who was going to help. Um, and these were the very first um, ones that they talked about. Um, so they mentioned that his eye contact was poor, um, that he struggled to organise himself through the day. So these were the objectives that they put in place to try and help him with that. So at that time, we didn't really think that a lot was wrong. Um, we just thought that he was a quiet five-year-old boy that just, you know, had one or two friends. We really didn't think much of it, but we took on board that they wanted to implement the individual educational plan. At that time as well, um, Aniron had a sister, uh, Gwenan, which was a big life change for him. So this is Aniron's collection at the age of five. Um, so he's always been a collector. <laughs> um, and this was, yeah, this was when he, um, he actually sent this photo off to the Thomas magazine and he was most disappointed that he didn't win the competition. Um, I think he should have. But again, he was a happy child. Um, he had one really solid friend um, and really didn't have any problems in school, um, apart from the organisational problems. So time went on um, and we got till about um, September 2016 um, and we were called into the school again after, the, after we'd done the IAP um, and they said that his behaviour was becoming worse, he was becoming more anxious, and he had increased difficulty in communicating with others. So I could start to notice it when we took him to school in the morning. He would always be on the periphery of the group, um, really um, not, not able to actually get involved. Um, but again, we, we were sort of open and we weren't thinking at that time that it was a definite diagnosis. Um, but we went with it anyway. So um, October time, um, we went to see a, a private doctor because we were told that it was very difficult to, for an iron to be seen within um, the, via the GP route. So we wanted to take him ourselves and be proactive in that. Um, so a special educational needs teacher uh, completed a pathway report prior to the private referral um, to support us with that private referral. Um, and we were told that he couldn't be seen unless he was actively harming himself or others via the GP route, which he wasn't. Sorry, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> it's quite difficult to... So, key points raised in the report. So, social conventions have been learnt and were not natural. He often played alongside others and was awkward. Organising himself for activities which was extremely difficult. 
He didn't like it when rules were broken and this would send him into a meltdown. He was in his bubble and he wasn't bothered by what was around him. And the last one that was mentioned was that Aniron simply exists in school, which was really tough for us to read. So, kind of had all this information in front of us and it was, it was really like the gravy train. We didn't know so, sort of what to do about it. So me being a researcher, and I'm a nurse by um, profession, I just needed to know everything. Um, so I Googled everything, you know, did everything I could do so that when we had that private referral, we would be well armed and we would know where we would, we would stand. So the first thing that I came across um, on, on Google, good old Google, was the ASSQ. Um, so we did, I did this myself one night, just sat in the house, um, and it was all to do with social interact interactions, learnt behaviours, and things that needed to be done throughout the day and how an Iron would cope. And he scored high. So obviously that score should warrant a, an assessment. So I, I printed it off and made sure I took it with me to the private referral. So timeline of events. So an Iron had his diagnosis um, by the private doctor in November 2016. This then um, created um, the, the GP referral to get into gear rate, really. Um, and we had a visit from the Caffili Autistic Spectrum Society. Um, they came and assessed an iron at home. Um, and then they referred him to uh, the Adolescent Mental Health Service for, for Caffili. So July 2017, um, they came in um, to the house and helped an iron get through his six weeks because six holidays are a nightmare for an iron. He struggles from the begin from the time he, he comes home from school, the very last day, to the time he goes back. He just can't cope with holidays. So they implemented the Starving the Younger Gremlin course, and that really helped him cope with his anxiety and get him through that summer. At that time as well, he lost one of his really good friends. So his anxiety level, levels were through the roof. We couldn't really do a lot with him. Um, he wanted me to add that picture as well because he, he Googled that and thought that that was quite appropriate. <laughs> so, oh gosh. So he was seen then finally in to November 2017 by the, the NHS um, psychiatrist and he actually agreed with the private referral saying that yes he is um, high functioning Asperger's and they discharged him from the service uh, so we had our official diagnosis. So at the time this was one of Aniron's first pictures that he drew when he was diagnosed and um, he's, can, I, can everyone see that sorry I'm in your way um, and he, he said that his emotions, he felt like he was the devil on strings. So his brain at the top there, it was the strings coming down and that he had all this anger inside him, all this emotion and he just didn't know what to do with it or how to get it out. At the time he was being relentlessly bullied um, and there are all the bullies around him, calling him a loser. Um, just... And then one little person saying, poor guy. <laughs> and everyone is different in every way. And actually, he scrumpled this up and threw it in his worry bin at the time because he just couldn't like, he didn't like looking at it. But I got it out and I thought, am I going to use this somehow um, to sort of help others along the way? This was another one. So sometimes I want to lock myself in my room just because I get picked on a lot and I mean a lot, and I feel like a de demon enters out of me. So this is an iron behind his closed door in his ha happy place, but with these emotions in the back of his mind. Um, and it says, which is quite funny, insert idiot here, <laughs> which I thought was quite good. Um, yeah, so not very nice drawings at the time of diagnosis, but they do get better. So this was an iron's eureka moment, and for any parent who's going through it, this book just explains Asperger's to a T. 
um, and I ordered it, and it's written by an adult, uh, Matt Friedman, and he's on Twitter if anyone wants to follow him. And I looked at it, we read it, my husband read it and understood it in a man's way, <laughs> as they do. Um, a few months down the line, we gave it to an iron and we said, just have a look at this now, see what you think. And halfway through, he looked and he said, oh my God, mum, that's, that's me, that book's about me. And from that moment, Aniron accepted his diagnosis and he, uh, he just changed overnight. So I can't recommend that book enough. So useful strategies that we put in place um, after his diagnosis. So Aniron couldn't, found things very difficult organizing himself and getting throughout the day. So we implemented a visual timetable. So at home and at school, so he knew exactly what he needed to do to get out of the door happily and safely to school. So he had to get up, he had to make his bed, he had to brush his teeth, you know, all these strategies to help him get through the day. And, sorry, <clears throat> the teachers also implemented that as well. Um, and they, you know, did it in school and it helped him get through the day as comfortable as, uh, as he could. They also implemented Lego Club, so Aniron just couldn't play, he didn't, couldn't have normal interactions with children and, and do the, the rough and tumble which other boys were doing. So they implemented a Lego Club and it was, a, it was strategies to actually make the children work together and play with one another and he actually got a few friends from that and you know they've stayed with him up until now. Social stories, and I know that there's been some books around um, in the, on the stalls there, um, teaching an iron how to show empathy, how to, you know, what to do if someone's feeling sad, how to, how to act. Um, they were really helpful. And the traffic light system. So an iron, if he was having a good day, he'd hold up the green card to the teachers so they knew that he was coping in the class. If he, something was becoming a bit difficult, he'd hold up the amber card. And then if he needed to be taken away, he'd hold up the red card and they'd take him out of the situation. Um, that was really, really helpful um, and got him through sort of two terms uh, quite happily. And explaining in a literal way. I know when we had a parents' evening once and the teacher said, oh my gosh, she said, I feel so awful. She said, I said, it's raining cats and dogs this morning. And Myron just went, Wait, <laughs> he just couldn't understand. He could not understand what that comment meant. So the teachers, we had to, as his parents, we had to actually literally teach the teachers how to talk to him in a way that he would understand in a literal way. Um, and a big one, which I know is all over, you know, is children everywhere now. That's how they live. But avoidance of group gaming. So an iron. He just cannot cope with, because you get these um, headsets, and I know he'd, he'd explain it a lot better than me, but um, headsets and you interact with the other children in, you know, in different games. He can't do it. It's just too much. There's too many people talking at the same time and have got their own agendas. So we just had to completely scrap that out of his uh, life, and he's, you know, he's accepted that reluctantly. <laughs> So this was another strategy that was put in place by the, by the uh, support worker that came to visit an iron. So it was really good, again, a really good visual. So what would happen if an iron wasn't happy and how it would escalate, how his behavior would escalate and how the ultimate thing, the worst thing in an iron's world would be to have his technology removed. So he knew that he had to stay sort of at the top um, otherwise, the worst thing for him would happen. The other side then, if, if he feels happy, everyone's happy, um, mum, and, mum and dad are happy. Um, and it was a really good strategy that he had to keep looking at and keep, it kept reminding him where he needed to be. But it was really good. So this was one of uh, Aniron's first drawings when, in, when I felt that he was starting to accept um, his diagnosis. Um, and it was, so he thinks differently because he has a different brain. And literally, that is it in a sentence. Um, but in his brain, he's non-violent, like some of the other children could be. 
I don't like things to change. I like to play my own games. I listen to my friends and I always tell the truth. So they were the main concepts that Aniron had that were different to the other children. So understanding, and this was understanding for him and me. So for years, I took him to parties. I made him sit down and play, play past the parcel. And he actually hated it. He actually hated it. And it was a real wake up call for me because I had actually put him through that when he actually didn't want to. And party games make him feel wah, wah, wah. <laughs> he hates them. <laughs> it's a big thumbs down. He's angry. Oh my God, just get me out of here. So now we take him and we take the iPad and if he's, we'll ask him if he wants to play past the parcel. If he doesn't, which is 99% of the time, he'll sit down and he'll play on the iPad and then when the game's over, he interacts as best he can. So that's our strategy. Um, I would never force a party on him ever again. <laughs> but I can understand why people do. Um, the worry bin, the famous worry bin. So an iron upset and anxious, mainly on a Sunday night when um, the thought of going back to school kicked in. Um, so these are some of the emotions. So he was sad. His teachers, they just irritated him because they gave him rules. I feel like I'm going to blow. Um, crazy, my head is spinning around. All these went out of his head, onto the paper and into the bin. And we still do that now. After his six weeks holiday, I think the main thought was the annoying children who keep on and on and on in the worry bin. <laughs> so it just really helps. We don't use it a lot now, but it actually is really, really a useful tool. So now, and Iron is much calmer now, and his little sister, with her uh, supporting autism. So the things that make him happy, drawing, plushies, he's a collector, didn't you know? <laughs> Lego, video games, YouTube, parkour, tennis, anime, superheroes. But finally, being the person of who he is today. And he's got a little autism sign there at the bottom. So he's happy in his skin. He's a nerd, and he's very, very proud of being a nerd. This is his slide. And he actually took the photo, made me take the photo of the pack of nerds. Um, Comic-Con is his world. He absolutely loves Comic-Con because as soon as he walks in that door, he's accepted. No one's looking at him and saying, you, you're different, you've got back teeth, you know, you've got this, you've got that. He walks in that room and he's accepted from, for the day. He loves it. You can see how happy he is there. So this is the final thought. If it works, I hope it does. I hope that you have enjoyed listening to my story. My life has always never been easy, but since I've been diagnosed, I've learned to accept who I am and always keep myself calm. I do get bullied because I am different from other children and I find it difficult to understand their interests and ways of thinking. As I understand myself more, this don't get easier. There is nothing wrong with being different. Different is good, and doing different things has made me being kind and caring. Thanks for listening. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> and that is my presentation. So, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> you alright? <laughs> there any questions? Anyone? Your phone and your worries are gone. Yeah, yeah. So any any worries is literally because he thinks so differently. He needs to see something. So his his thought is always in his mind. And again, it, it, all these thoughts make him the angry devil. Um, if he can get a thought out, then it just relieves his anxiety. Um, and you know, the more worries that are in the bin, the less that are in his mind. And, and it, that is the strategy that works so well. Oh, okay. Really, really good. Yeah. Anyone else? How, how do you actually get him to um, communicate with you? So like with the worry bin, how, how, how do you get him to actually write that out to him? Um, it's at the end of the night. So he speaks to me better than he speaks to his dad, you know, in that respect, in, in sharing his concerns. 
Um, we've got very, two very different strategies in our house of how we deal with it. Um, but yeah, normally at, late at night where he's got all these worries, is catching him when he's got time to think and late at night is when he's thinking. Yeah. Um, he really struggles to go to bed early. Um, so I'll go in and I'll just say, and he, it, it, this is the joke now, I say, any worries, any nighttime concerns now? And he'll say, God, ma'am, <laughs> you know, it's like, why are you asking me that now? And I'm like, but that's our little joke. But then I'll sit down and he'll, he'll say nothing, but then it'll start to come out. Right. Yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah. Just, it's just knowing, the finding the right time. Um, and it will come out, but he does keep an awful lot inside. So when the other day a, a child had upset him in the schoolyard and um, this, this kid came over to him and was helping him and it, you could see he had all this emotion inside and he was, he, whatever the kid had said and he wouldn't have said anything but the child just seen it, you know, or seen this snide comment and came in. Nye does keep a lot inside, doesn't he? So yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks. That's it, yeah? Thank you.